Hi, I'm Dr. Sari Robinson from Oregon State University, and I have made a pilgrimage to Lindquist Studios uh, to chat with Mark Lindquist um, all about spalted wood. And so if you are at all familiar with the history of spalted wood in this country, um, you will know a great deal about Mark. And this is a very, um, this is a very epic sort of meeting. I'm very excited to be here. My interest in spalted wood began in high school, and if you're watching this, hi Mr. Bloom, my old high school woodshop teacher. I was hesitant to begin doing much work on the lathe in high school. I was really into furniture, I really enjoyed furniture making, and I had done a little bit of spindle work for boy, my freshman year of high school. We had made a little, little end table type of thing, and it hadn't, uh, turning hadn't really impressed me at the time and um, my my teacher Mr. Bloom he was trying to get me interested in turning and then one day he brought in a piece of box elder which was bright pink and I my mind was blown because up until that point wood was brown it was oak or it was maple or it was birch and it was it was nice and it was fun but I mean this was pink and uh, and I was like like, what, what is this? And of course, at the time, we didn't really understand the distinction between tree colors and, and spalting. And so we called it, we called it spalted wood. And he said, you know, this is, this is spalted wood. And I was like, what, what do you do with this? And you turn with it. And so um, he got me interested in turning through bribery, basically. Um, I turned uh, box elder, I turned ambrosia maple. And then once I had turned a few pieces and I realized just how fast it was, like you, to make a table could take you, you know, in high school time when you're only in the shop one hour a day, you know, it would take you six months to make a table. I ended up becoming a big into turning. That was pretty much, I think, all I did my last, maybe my last semester of high school. And so that really, that was really, um, it was really good for me. And, uh, and the colors just continued to, to blow my mind. And so I was really checked out in high school. Anyway, I, high school and I did not get along. And so the wood shop, the wood shop was probably the one thing that kept me going to school, um, which is funny because now I'm a professor and I've gone all the way through, but if it hadn't been for wood shop and spalting and, and Mr. Bloom, I would not be a professor today. Well, I, I hadn't wanted to go to college. Um, my parents were, were very big into higher education, and rightly so, and they really, really wanted me to get a four-year degree. And I had dreams of, uh, you know, carpentry or cabinet making or doing a trade of some form because I really loved wood. And so my mother, bless her heart, was so determined um, for me to go to a university that she got on the very new and exciting internet. Because remember, this is 1999. And she started looking for programs that had woodworking involved in them. And we were having a really hard time finding them. There just were not a lot because I didn't want to just take a class. I wanted it, it was either gonna be my degree or I wasn't going. And so she ended up finding Northern Michigan University, which um, I think still does, um, at least back then, it had a really nice woodworking program. They had a great 3D arts. They have, you know, metal smithing and blacksmithing and, and all of those types of things. And they had um, a great wood shop. And when we went to tour, it was, you know, they had a studio room, they had a shop, and then they just had a turning studio, which had, I don't even know, five or six big lathes. None of these like middies. Middies were only just coming out at the time. And so they had big, big lathes. And we walked in there and then I was just done. And I was like, okay, this, this will work. This will work fine. And so I basically did wood turning um, for that, for the time of my undergraduate degree. And I kept looking at spalted wood. Um, I still really didn't understand it. Um, I got more into wood burning during that time because I was still looking for doing more to the wood than just having it be uh, a brown or a beige. And so I, I kind of developed uh, my pyrography skills during that time, but I was still really entranced with spalted wood. And so by the time I finished my, my undergraduate degree, I had a great deal of understanding of form and function. It was an art degree. And so I, you know, I, I studied Yukioe and I, and I studied art history and I studied woodworking, but I didn't really understand wood. And that was troublesome to me that I could use a table saw, but I didn't understand why we only do some types of cuts on a table saw. And so I moved over into wood science, which is basically woodworking, but with an understanding of wood instead for my master's and PhD. And that filled in the rest of the gap in terms of understanding wood. Now it wasn't just how do you form wood and make it 
aesthetically pleasing and you know have actual like social context to it but how does wood work how does it move with water what are the physics and chemistry and anatomy of wood and because i was in the sciences that you know have money sadly unlike the arts um, i needed i needed a, a thesis project and and the world was much more open because there was money around and so my my master's advisor peter lax you know we had a conversation like, what are you interested in and we talked about woodworking and, um, and then I brought him in some pieces of, of spalted wood. In fact, some of the original pieces that I still had from high school, I had kept with me. Um, and, you know, he said, you know, well, what is that? And I was like, well, it's, it's spalted wood. And he said, no, but what is that? And I, and I was like, I have no idea what it is. One of the things that confused me, especially during my master's, when I was still figuring out how to do research, was what had happened because Spalted wood was very popular in Europe, in Germany, um, in, in Sweden, in, in Austria, Augsburg, all those areas. And it was very heavily the blue-green wood of Chlorosoboria, which is Elf's Cup. That was very, very popular. And of course, they used other types of spalted wood. They used zone lines, they used blue stain. But blue-green wood was so important. And then there was just, there was this gap. And then there was, then starting back up in, in the 60s, in the United States and moving forward, there was spalted wood, but it was just this obsession with zone lines. And that was really confusing for a while because I couldn't quite figure out, there was a, there was a, a missing gap in there that would take me oh, another 10 years to really unravel. But as I started looking, looking through the literature, um, you know, the name Lindquist kept coming up. And this, but something that, that, that happened was because the industrial revolution came around and because there were more synthetic pigments, spalted wood sort of, fell by the wayside. The guilds, you know, they, they just couldn't, they couldn't compete with the Industrial Revolution. They carefully guarded their guild secrets and spalted wood was, was basically lost aside from a few little colonies that kept it going. And so it was basically rediscovered here in North America. And that was Mel Lindquist. his legacy here with spalted wood is that you know, he would go out and he got really interested in zone lines. And you know, his son was an artist and, and they got together and they started you know, using zone lined wood and they're the ones who coined the word spalted wood and it became this huge cultural phenomenon that, that just took over U.S. wood turning. And it became so popular, and it still is popular to this day, whether or not people remember that it was the linguists that started it. And so zone lines have become an American fatuation. Is, that is really hard to work through and you know we had Google of course by then and so I started googling it and it turned out that no one really had like a really firm grasp of what spalted wood was you know one website said this one website said this um, there were some older articles of course by Mark Lindquist that had very very specific um, subgroups of uh, you're know, talking about zone lines and things like that but they were also still very they were very on the art side, which was very engaging, but also now I was in the sciences and I was really trying to understand what it was. And so I looked in the science literature and I paired that with the art literature and it just, it spiraled and it, and it kept getting deeper and deeper. That was in, when you're in graduate school, you're supposed to perform literature reviews. And, and that is, you know, read everything that's ever been done on your subject, you know, until you can't, then still there's nothing else. So if you get a paper, and it's about your topic and it's got 10 references. You need to pull all those references and then you read those papers and then you pull all the references from those. And so it, it spirals out until you hit, you know, 1785 and everything's in Latin and you can't translate it anymore. You know, in, in science, especially, you know, you go back to the dawn of the microscope or things like that. You don't have to go super far back, but spalting just kept going. And, you know, the more I learned and the more I uncovered, um, you know, it wasn't just the U.S. Now it was Europe. Now it was old guilds. Now it was, now we were in the 1800s. Now it was the 1700s. Now it's the 1200s. 
And all of a sudden there's texts in Gothic German that we have to get specialists to figure out because, because we have no idea what they say. And, and so it just, the world kept opening and I had to come up with a definition um, that was more encompassing than what we currently had in the US because it became very clear very early on that we were having, uh, we kept having um, science and art and they kept coming together and diverging. And every time they diverged, there was a problem. Spalted left the collective consciousness or people just got hung up on one certain type. But every time they were together, whether it was the 1400s and it was alchemy and guilds and, and art all being twined together, or whether it's now where the art and science are coming together, then you got a much bigger, a much bigger picture of what Spalted Wood was. And so that rabbit hole is just, it just keeps getting deeper. And I don't know if I'm ever going to come out of it because there's so much that we don't know still. Because spalting, spalting as it's defined now is, is it, it's everything. It's, I tried to go back to the original, you know, sort of Germanic roots of it, which was Piltholz, which is fungus wood. And so wood that's been colored by fungus. So it's not just zone lines, it's, it's all these other types of fungi as well. But, but how do you do that when America, which always seems to think of itself as number one and the best, and clearly if we said it, then it has to be this way. How do you start educating people that zone lines are awesome, but have you considered the other parts of spalting? And that's been, it's been an uphill battle because so many woodworkers, um, we have the internet now, that's, and that's fantastic, but so much of um, wood turning history, especially has been word of mouth. So what, what grind of gouge do you use? Um, you know, how do you orient the wood? Do you use spalted wood? Well, spalted wood is this. And so that, that um, you know, oral history basically that we have in the United States was spalted wood is zone lines and, and not even zone lines, spalted wood is black line. And, and so rewriting that has been a challenge and it's only really in the past, I'd say two to three years that all the work that I've been doing for the past like 15 years has started, I've started seeing it filter through because I give talks at, at wood turning clubs and, and you know, I do demonstrations at the AAW symposiums and it, it's starting to seem like that information now is, is seeping, is seeping down and it's seeping down far enough now that when I go out and talk to people, um, I now I'm starting to hear that, well, spalting is caused by fungi and it's lines and pigment. And that's been, I mean, that's been really, really nice to hear. So in my second day, I was finally brought into the Lindquist Gallery, which is what you see behind you. I finally convinced Mr. Mark Lindquist to get on camera, which was no small feat. And we are, we're here in his gallery, which has a ton of spalted wood in it. So um, I have, I have so many questions um, that I didn't, when I first interviewed you on the phone a couple of years ago now, I was one, completely overwhelmed that you would even talk to me. And two, then you gave so much information. And, uh, and we're, we're gonna have a bit of a conversation, which I think would be really, I think would be really good. It's such an important story because it fills in a gap that we had. I wasn't sure how many woodworkers I was gonna have to interview to figure out what had happened. Because we had the old history, um, and that was uh, also partially due to my co-author, Hans Mikkelsen, who's an art restorer in Germany. He's worked on a lot of these old pieces and so he knew about them. And so we had that chunk um, and we were able to, to do a lot of uh, going around Europe and looking at old churches and stuff. And then there was just sort of this, well, what happened? Like what, how did, how did, how was it so important for hundreds of years? And then nothing, and then this, and then your story with Mel and you, it was just, that's what happened. That's how it came here. And that's how it kind of got distorted a little bit in translation because it it didn't come over it it happened naturally it just sort of organically sprung up again which was a cool story well it is a cool story and what's what's also really cool about it is to think that really for mel where things happened was in alaska you know where where beavers had cut down trees for dams and i'm talking about big trees and the, those trees became spalted and he saw that and so he kind of had an inkling of what, you know, he, he never knew what it was, but he knew that it was. And then when, it, when that happened 
uh, on, on, you know, blazing the trail that he saw it, it reminded him instantly, oh yeah, that's that stuff. I haven't seen that since Alaska mm -hmm. and wow, I'm going to do something with this. So, uh, you know, and his, his doing that stuff, he'd had a heart attack and, and retired from General Electric, you know, at, at a certain point and he began getting out there and it just coincided that uh, you know, people were making and selling things at uh, little craft shops throughout the country, and they were called boutiques at the time. And um, then the craft fairs uh, started springing up, and there were a lot of craft fairs in the area. Uh, um, Washington Park in Troy, New York, Fox Hollow, which was a folk festival, and that's what that's what it would be. Is that you know you you go to these music happening type things and, and then the craftspeople would be out in the woods. That was the that. era too though. I mean that, that yeah. 60s and 70s, that was very much what was going on with yeah, the US. Particularly with Woodstock yeah. and things like that. You know, you had people making sandals at, at Woodstock and selling them and was like belts and the things like perfect that. storm of coincidences because mm. He, he could have discovered spalted wood and it could have been a time where everyone wanted things made out of aluminum. So maybe we could talk a little bit more about growing up with Mel. Sure. I always felt proprietary about spalted wood. It was something I grew up with, you know. It was, it was something that uh, I felt, you know, my father and I had discovered. We, we, of course, we didn't invent spalted wood, but but we you rediscovered it. And it's, yeah, yeah, well, we 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 discovered it for ourselves mm -hmm. on on his land, and then Mel made something out of it, and I followed suit, you know. And Mel was um, he was in the army. He was a, a surveyor and a, and a cartographer. And he was in Alaska, and he was like uh, a woodsman and an outdoorsman. And he would go off uh, in Alaska for weeks on end with just a pup tent and a, uh, a two-man saw over his shoulder, and he would do surveying and, and map making for the Army. And he loved being in the outdoors. And when he transferred with General Electric, um, to uh, Schenectady, New York, uh, with uh, he he bought uh, close to a hundred acres of land in the upstate New York Adirondacks, and so every weekend we went up there and we worked on camp. We always called it camp, and uh, went out into the woods. And uh, there was a time when Mel. Uh, cut through a white birch tree, uh, making a trail. He was big on making trails. That's what you do in forestry, you make trails. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, cut, he cut into the white birch tree and it was just full of black lines and he called them watermarked lines. And I could see the look in his eyes. He just, you know, his eyes got wide and he said, oh, we're gonna take these back to camp. and. Uh, you know, this is like in 1959, 1960, and... So you were 10? Yeah, I was 10 years old. Uh, and he was amazing because he let me just do about anything. He put a chainsaw in my hands when I was 10 years old and said, oh, go cut those things down. And didn't show me how to do it much. He, I watched him and I saw how to do it and, and I would... I would work with him. We built log cabins and he did show me how to, you know, skive the logs and make one log fit into another. I mostly spent my time making things because that's what uh, Mel did. He was a great role model. Someone came up to me and said, you sure picked the right father. It was uh, really an amazing upbringing, learning about the woods, learning about the forest, learning about the trees, always getting trees that were downed, never really cutting live trees, um, just forced conservation in a way. And I think one of the things that is perhaps not as well understood or really appreciated about spalted wood is, is the role it played in shaping wood turning. Um, you can't really have a conversation about wood turning in the United States 
and its evolution without discussing spalted wood as much as some people might like to do so. So up until about the 60s, wood turning was, it, it, it wasn't nearly as pervasive as it is now. And it was very much, things had to be perfect. So they had to be straight grained and they had to be perfectly formed. And you know, there was no live edge stuff happening. It was all, it was perfection. And then the linguists hit the scene and all of a sudden we were, we were getting, you know, different things. There were um, all these crazy colors. There was rot. I mean, who puts rot in their wood? Um, and, and everything started, they, they started doing this and then they were doing different things, craft shows, art shows, these types of things. And it, and it, and it literally like split wood turning in a whole different direction. At the time that spalted wood happened, uh, it was written in Fine Woodworking Magazine that Mark and Melvin Lindquist unleashed spalted wood upon the world. Definitely so, unleashed it on North America. It was like the Big Bang. Uh, James Krenoff was using spalted wood and we were friends as well. Um, and he was just a great guy. Um, it, it revolutionized wood turning. And all of a sudden, things didn't have to be straight grain. The, the public consciousness entirely, it, their acceptance of it, just completely did, it did a 180 and all of a sudden now straight just wasn't, you know, straight um, perfect pieces were, were on the out and all of a sudden it was spalted was hot. <laughs> and all of these things that were different um, became so important and and in a way that 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 freed wood turning a little bit and it, it made it it made it into something that wasn't so rigidly controlled <laughs> spalting is right it's you even with all the science we have now you can't control it you can direct it but you can't control it and and so it's it's so neat that that spalting and wood turning at least in the u.s really they really evolved together and and changed the whole dialogue of wood turning and, and that's what the linguists did you know when you see mark and mills pieces and when you see them in in museums you know at the met at the smithsonian and and you take a look at them and, you know, I, I've seen interesting reactions to them, but there's so much context you're missing in that this was not done. This was not a thing. When you look at one of their pieces, it's so different than what had come before in terms of texture, in terms of spalting, in terms of live edge, in terms of grain that is not 
proper. That is the significance of that piece, that it was a completely different discourse. It was, it was a, you know, two people being willing to change the conversation entirely and say, I don't really care that, that this is what proper turning is. This is what I want to do. And, and it just, it changed, it changed everything. And we're still, we, we still have that battle. I mean, if you're a wood turner, you know that battle. You go to turning groups um, or you go to symposiums and, and there's still a divide almost between this is the correct way to turn. This is how you should have your gouge. Um, you know, this is always don't turn end grain, turn side grain or, or whatever people say. And then you've got the person who's, you know, using a, a shank of metal. They ground themselves and going into a bowl that's not centered. And, and they're doing something that's completely a different dialogue. Or, I mean, even today, people still fight against spalted wood. There's still a lot of chatter about, is spalted wood gonna kill me? Is spalted wood too dangerous to turn? Is it gonna blow up on the lathe? I mean, it's, it's still there. It's still butting up against convention, like every time. And, and I love that about spalted wood, that it's, it's always something that people kind of think, oh, that's cool, but should you? Like, it, it's, it's always there. And, and it's great that that started with the Linquists and made it, made it so much more acceptable, I guess, to, to explore wood and, and the different parts of wood that weren't just perfect. There's nothing in this world that's perfect. Uh, you can look at yourself or you can look at your, your neighbor or you could look at, uh, look at uh, whoever you want to. And there's some imperfections in these piece, people. Now, as far as I'm concerned, wood has imperfections in it, and, and they're just like people. Uh, wood is just, just like people. And if you can bring out the beauty of this, uh, people with imperfections are, gr are great people. I was the first one to use spalted wood as a medium for turning uh, vases and bowls and this sort of thing up until I started doing it. No one would dare to touch this stuff. Here's an old piece of wood, you know, and it doesn't look like much, but when you get through with it, hey, it can be real pretty. say, but I'm game. I am, I'm open. I'm open. Okay. the Applied Mycology Lab, um, and it's in the Department of Wood Science at Oregon State University. Zone lines are, are melanin, and they're very in a very distinct area, and pigments tend to be the things that diffuse through wood. So these are two pieces of spalted sycamore in various stages of spalting. There's not just one fungus on this at all. There's, there's a bunch of different fungi on here. There are lots of different types, even of just zone lines. What a lot of people don't seem to realize is that there's so many colors of zone lines and that even if you just say I like black zone lines, there's so many thicknesses of black zone lines. People have very distinct preferences and they always seem to think that the one that they like is is the most typical, which that there's there's really no typical thickness of zone line. When I see these types of zone lines, this is this is very linguist to me. It's a very 
it's very much their type of zone lines and the kinds of ones that, that I see in a lot of their work. There's a lot of these very, like very thin, instead of the Sharpie marker line here, these are almost like a, an artist, a very fine tipped artist pen line. They, they get really mixed up in one another. They're, they're not just one line on the piece. You see a mixture of the circular and, and the rounded. You don't see so much of, of the straight. So all three of these pieces are, are Mel Lindquist pieces, and he, you, you can see the form that, that's very distinctive of Mel, and a vase shape that's very evocative of, of pottery um, and very specific types of, of pottery. His zone lines are, are melanin, and they're very in a very distinct area, and pigments tend to be the things that diffuse through wood. The East Coast, they have very thin ones. In the Midwest, which is where I grew up, we have we have these these thicker ones that look like they're they're diffusing in a way into the wood. So there are pigmenting fungi, of course, that leave the blues and the reds and the greens in the wood. And then you know there are zone lines, which you know you think of as lines, but they're not they're not such different things. You know, there's a very clear evolutionary path between them. Is there still there's still a diffusing pigment? Melanin, which is what they're composed of, is just a high molecular weight pigment. So there's still just a pigment that's you know trying to move through wood. Zone lines in particular have been have been relatively well studied since about I think 1913. These lines tend to not actually be black, which um, people call them black lines, which is a big misnomer. But of course they're not called black lines in science. Um, they're called zone lines, although they have much fancier names. Going back through and digging through scientists figuring out you know what they were made of. his last name was Campbell, did a, did a big paper on the zone lines of Xyleria species and Armillaria species, which are both fungi. Um, and he, he started looking at the, you know, what, what made them up. And then as you, you can follow the sort of evolution of science, you know, what are they? Are they mineral deposits? Are they melanin? Are they, what are they? And of course there are lots of different types and they, uh, they are generally composed of melanin, but, but there's clearly others. It's science, you know, welcome to the world of there's never one correct answer. And we want to understand uh, what the fungi are doing that actually makes them occur. If you understand what it takes to make a zone line, then you can make your own zone lines. And that means that it's not going to be any more, um, you know, from Mark's childhood going around and uh, with your chainsaw in the woods in the cold, and, and pulling out, you know, down trees and, and hoping that they have spalting. The, all that old science literature made it possible for us to sit down and go, all right, so there are fungi and when fungi get together, sometimes they make zone lines, sometimes they make zone lines for other reasons. And we can look at all this old literature and even the newer stuff that was coming out of Brigham Young University, you know, Lane Phillips work, where he was doing pairings with uh, white rot fungi to make zone lines, building off of all of that to come up with, you know, sort of a, a catalog of fungi that quote unquote don't play well together, um, that make these zone lines. That really helped us be able to understand spalting and study it and, and start inducing it, which is what started us um, down the road to actually being able to make spalted wood in laboratory setting. And if you know what you're doing and you know the fungi you're using and you know how fast they grow, um, when you put them on and, and if you control the other factors, then you can stop it before you actually get the rot. And, and that, was, that was really the benefit of using all those old papers, especially some of the, the, the studies done by Rayner and Rayner and Todd and, and Body, looking at how different stages of successional fungi move in and, and how they um, contribute to zone lines. So one of the real treats of this trip has been to get to put my hands on a lot of history. 
because of course Mark has a lot of the pieces you know that we talk about in the Spalting book and that are just so entrenched with the history of how Spalting developed here in the United States. And so this is this is such an important piece. So take a look at it here. It's got those nice nice thin zone lines that a lot of people in the East Coast are really big fans of. It's got a fair amount of rot as you can see. Now this piece, I mean it looks pretty shiny. Um, it looks, I mean, it's, it's, it's had some experiences in life, but it's, it's actually very, very heavy. And this piece right here is one of the first pieces that went through the methacrylation process. So this is a, a collaborative piece between Mel Lindquist and Mark Lindquist and Dale Nish, and then his student at the time, Kip Christensen. So if you are only moderately familiar with this, Dale Nish, um, who was at, um, that's Brigham Young University, was working on a, a way to stabilize spalted wood. Now, stabilizing spalted wood is just something we do now. Um, everyone talks about, you know, what's your, do you use cactus juice? Do you use CA glues? What do you use? Well, back in the 70s, there, just, there just wasn't. I mean, you used spalted wood and it exploded on you or you knew what you were doing. Um, and that was pretty much it. And so Dale and Mel um, were, I, it sounds like they were discussing this. Dale came up with this idea to, to pressure treat and methacrylate the wood. So put in methyl methacrylate. And uh, that was part of Kip Christensen's research project for his master's degree. And so this is one of the first pieces that was ever methacrylated and its, it's weight is is quite substantial, but it, it did a really nice job of, of making the wood, um, you know, a little bit more uniform. You can still see density differences. I mean, they're still there. This was very early, early work, but it's, it's a neat piece of history. And what's even better is that Mark has gifted it to me so I can have it in my um, nerdy spalting wood collection, which is fantastic. This is not a spalting bin. So on this piece, Mark has put it back in the shavings and it's just giving the blue stain more time. One of the neat things about blue stain is that we, we classify it as a pigment, but blue stain is actually melanin. And if you'll recall, melanin is what is, is, what is in zone lines. Um, it's a different type of melanin. Now there's lots and lots of different types of melanin. Um, one of the reasons that it, it's, it's black, but it, it looks blue because of the way it's in wood and the way the light hits um, and bounces off and that makes it appear blue. But then when you get it very highly concentrated, like what you see here, then you can see it's, it's much more black. And so here, what's going on is the blue stain is getting more heavily concentrated. And it's coming in and looking darker. Blue stain is a, is a weird category of pigment. Blue stain is, it's something in between a zone line and a pigment because zone lines are, are melanin and they're very in a very distinct area and pigments tend to be the things that diffuse through wood which means that they're being excreted by the fungal hyphae so the strands of the fungi are actually excreting the pigment but most blue stains their melanin is actually within their cell their their hyphal walls now not all of it some of them of course do excrete the melanin but a lot of them it's it's the hyphae themselves that are blue so when we talk about um, pigmented wood and we talk about chlorosuboria wood, which is the blue-green, the one that's been used historically the most, um, that you, you could in theory have a piece of blue-green wood and not find, you know, you could cut into the center and maybe not find any actual fungi because the fungi are secreting the pigment and the pigment is going into the wood. Blue stains, that's usually not what happens. Usually there are going to be hyphae and the, the melanin itself is within the hyphae. Now, of course, this is science, so we always have to say usually because of course, just like with any living organism, there's always going to be, um, you know, ones that buck the trend. We've done a lot of work with um, separating the pigments out from the wood. And, and on one hand, that's nice because now you can have the pigments in, in a little jar and you can put them on wood as you will. So you don't have to wait for the fungi to grow. These pigments are, are really very interesting um, compounds and they are very understudied because they don't, you know, they don't have any real, well, they haven't until now had any real relevance in science. Most spalting fungi aren't um, aggressive forest pathogens. So people aren't studying them to control them. They don't cause human health issues. So people aren't studying them to control them. Um, and they, especially um, with the pigments, they don't occur with enough frequency 
for them to be really heavily utilized in large pieces. You can grow the pigments um, and you can grow the spalting and you take the pigments out. Their properties are so unique. Um, we have a red one and I'm gonna start saying off some Latin names. So we have uh, a red fungus called Cytolidium cuboidium that we call flaming dragon fungus. So you can pick which one of those you prefer. And it is uh, a gorgeous, it's, it's that pink red of box elder. It, now it does not cause the pink red of box elder, but it's that same color. Um, and within its color range, it can do blue or purple or orange or red or pink. And its pigment has, has never really been looked at. There's an old paper by, by Galinsky, but that's about it. And, and we recently found out that it's a crystal, a naturally occurring crystal, brand new to science, so we get to name it. Um, and, and so all of these, these pigments, um, they, they haven't really been looked at or studied. The, the blue-green one that comes from Chlorosoboria species, Chlorosoboria aeruginescens and Chlorosoboria aeruginosa, um, the common name is Elf's Cup for that. It's that little blue-green cup fungus. Um, it has, um, we, we actually have done some preliminary work and it, it can be used to make um, the, the thin films on solar cells. I mean, solar energy from spalting fungi. The, there's so much potential here. The, the pigments can be extracted and we we successfully use them you know, as decking finishes to help prevent UV, we can put them in paints. Um, you know, there's, they have so many neat applications from solar cells and biomarkers to, to paints and home finishes, and of course, back to spalting. And, and that's, that's the best part about being able to be an artist in the sciences. Um, and, I, and I guess that's the thrill of, of, of bio art too, and the, the movements of bio art that are happening, is that when you give artists money, and facilities, um, the the places you can go with art that you didn't expect to go are are amazing. And so maybe in 20 years, you know, the solar cells that you put on your house will be from spalted wood because the you know the tests we've run show that it just has amazing potential for these particular types of cells. <laughs> about these pigments that, that differentiate them so much from other fungal pigments um, or even synthetics is that they're just so color stable. Um, and, and you can see that if you look at the artworks from the 1200s, the 1300s, the 1400s, I mean, even from the 1800s, all of the other pigments that were put on the wood have faded and the, the, the rest of the wood is just brown. But that blue green, um, the blues from the, the blue staining fungi, the zone lines, they're all still there and they're still quite bright. And so that's, I mean, from the 1200s to today, that type of color fastness, that's unheard of. Um, and it's, we see that too, we see it with our reds, we see it with our yellows, um, all of these spalting fungi, they, they hold a very distinct ecological niche. And so they, they have, um, you know, they've adapted and evolved, these fungi have over millennium to have pigments that are very, they're very sticky, that are very resilient, um, that don't move with water because they have to stay on the wood to protect the wood for the fungus so that other fungi can't grow. And it's those really unique properties that make these pigments so useful for us because you know they're naturally occurring, so they're not synthetic. When art and science come together, when spalted wood and the art and science sides are together, now all of a sudden we have solar panels. I mean, we have, we have dyes, we have pigments, and we have 
a wonderful history of art that we're not forgetting anymore. And that's, I mean, that's why art and science have to always be together. Spalting has never been, it's, it's never been something that's been able to really draw grant dollars. And, and because we've been able to do all this background research and, and explore these other areas, now, now industry is starting to take interest. Um, you know, I, with a group of, of other researchers, um, we, we got an $800,000 grant from the Walmart Foundation to look at using the fungal pigments as textile dyes. Now it's serious. Now we're starting to get grants. Now, you know, people, industry, uh, the National Science Foundation, they're, they're looking at this stuff and going, huh, okay. So that is interesting and you do have the preliminary look. So let's see what the possibilities are. If you want something that isn't gonna fade, these pigments don't fade and we probably have the longest running study on them because we have pieces from all the way back in the 1200s. We, you know, we've used them as textile dyes. Um, we're actually working right now with putting them in inkjet printers to print textiles. And we've, had, we've had some good luck with that. But the, the initial um, fabric testing we did with them, you know, there are some fabrics that you put these pigments on. Um, polyester, which is notoriously hard to dye, the pigments work very well on polyester. And you can wash them in hot water and then bleach them and the pigment is still there. I mean, can you imagine like not having to worry about bleach accidentally getting into your clothes and, and bleaching out the color? The pigments are, I mean, they're so permanent. And, and that's just not, it's just not something we have right now. When we jump, we jump. And it, and it moves into something completely different. I would suspect that at some point we're gonna start looking at the pigments in terms of cancer research. I, I could see them you know, somehow being utilized in cancer research or, or as medicine. I, I could see that that may be, may be happening in the future. I, I think in the, in the short term, we're gonna start seeing them become much more prevalent in terms of you're gonna see paints, you're gonna see housing paints and decking and things because of the UV resistance, um, car paints even. I think we're gonna see a, a big explosion of artist paints. But definitely in the future, you know, once we move past solar, I think, and, and anything that ties with solar, so anything that has lenses, you know, Mark's very excited about the, the possibility of, uh, especially chlorosoboria being used for camera lenses. Um, and I could see that happening, definitely. So lenses, films, and, and uh, medicine, I think are gonna be really neat. And wouldn't that be, I mean, wouldn't that be a great, a great thing, you know, to go from this alchemy, this this old guild secret, and bring it all the way back around again to medicine and, and, and full circle. Hey, it is day three in the studio, the wonderful, famous Mark Linquist studio, and we are ready to start conspiring on a piece of spalted wood. Hi everyone. Um, this is the very fine Dale Nish apparel provided by Mark Linquist, which is amazing. Also amazing that we have the same size shoulders. Very nice. And this is our piece of wood that we are going to be working with today. It is a piece of sycamore spalted with uh, black stone lines and white rot. And it's actually fairly sound. We, we looked at some other pieces earlier and there was a lot of uh, fingernail poking and some uh, they might have some brown rot mm, they're a little gross uh, but this one actually is is really sound and we've got some of these medium thick zone lines in here some of the thin ones that mark likes some of the fatter ones that i like and then a big old glob of melanin down here not quite sure what's going on there but we're gonna find out uh some of these zone lines this piece is is really dry so i don't think we'll see much color coming out of the zone lines but it should be really entertaining to see what's on the inside because the spalting changes around all the different sides. So, wait and see. We just cut onto this piece and we're very, very surprised. So we thought the first six to eight inches weren't gonna have too much in them. It didn't look like there was much on the inside. But as you just saw, the inside was actually a huge treasure trove of very fantastic zone lines. So now I'm getting really excited about what our final piece is. Look 
together. And they're perfect. They're absolutely perfect. It's pretty sound too. There's just a little bit of lignin loss through here. And for the record, turning and doing this without the mask for the video, always wear a mask. I'm really old school about my gouges. Um, I don't really use the fingernail gouges that much. Um, I have them and uh, I like them, but I use all kinds of gouges. To me, it doesn't matter uh, how you get there. It's that you get there. That's what matters to me.
This is an unusual gouge. It has a hook on the end of it. You can see um, just the way that it's sharpened. It has a little OG on it. There we go. Turn it around. There's the hook. Very interesting. What do you use that hook for? It creates a second kind of gouge, really. You know? It's very aggressive. It gives a pretty nice clean cut, really. You see that where I did a finish mm -hmm. push cut there. Um, it's it's pretty clean. This is more than old school. It's just the way I do it, and and it, this is the kind of thing that um, I've I've just developed this little hook on the corner. Uh, over years of, of turning with with gouges and I've never seen anybody else do it um, uh, I don't I can't remember whether I picked it up from my father or or if I just uh, it, it, the tool um, fell into that shape over many years of quick uh, unintentional kind of sharpening but now I, I do have a couple of them that I do that kind of sharpening because they work so nicely for me. Not, not for everybody. Be really fun to talk a little bit about wood turning with you if you're game i have so many questions i am game you might not like what i say but i'm, I'm like, game i am i'm open I'm so open. we okay. have we've roughed out a bowl now and uh, we thought we would sit and chat for a little bit because i noticed that um the the types of bowl gouges you use and and the way you're moving them well familiar to me are are not what i see most people doing at all and and are a type of technique that i have been told in the past is very beginner um, and isn't necessarily uh, you know something that you would expect a, an advanced turner to be doing so could you maybe talk a little bit about why you choose to use those tools and and why you turn the way you do yes well i think to begin with um, I am a beginner turner. I've been a beginner for about 50 years. And the reason is because I keep a beginner's mind. I have, for the longest time, done things my own way and not, not the way everybody else does. At this point, there's, there's a, 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 a prevailing attitude that if, unless you're using a uh, fingernail grind gouge, you're not an advanced turner or, or, or whatever, particular techniques. And I, I just have a real problem with that because um, there are many ways um, to, to get to the form that, that that you're after, and particularly with spalted wood. I think that uh, turning is a very personal thing, and for anyone who 
uh, says that you must turn a certain way, well, let them turn their way and, and I'll turn my way. And, and uh, you know, going on nearly 50 years now, uh, you know, I have a lot of different ways of doing things that people would, would be very surprised at. I've only recently gotten, uh, you know, four jaw chucks. And only um, because uh, a good friend of mine, Terry Martin, and uh, was coming to visit, and I wanted to make sure that I had chucks for him to use. Uh, and they're they're nice, I, you know. I like it. They're they're fine. Um, but it doesn't doesn't matter to me. It, it's just another tool. It's another tool in the toolbox. <clears throat> What's mostly important is to is to have a vision of what you want to what you want to do, where you want to go with the bowl, and follow the wood. So everybody has their way of doing things, and I'm a live and let live kind of guy when it comes to turning, you know. Um, a beginner, in my mind, is, is, uh, is a very, you know, wonderful place to be, because th that means that you have the whole world ahead of you, or in front of you, you know, you have a whole, all, kinds of possibilities open to you uh, to where you can go. I, I want to have the beginner's mind always. Sari, let me ask you a question or two, if I may. Um, when you turn, what are you looking for as a turner? What, what, what are your main concerns? So I mostly use um, spalted wood. In fact, I don't necessarily, I don't think I remember the last time I turned a piece of wood that wasn't spalted, which makes sense because that's my, that's my research and that's what I work with. And so when, I, when I'm turning a piece of wood, I'm specifically looking to highlight the spalting as best I can. And I am often giving preferential form to the rarer types. So if I have a piece that is mostly zone lines that has a pocket of pink, I'm going to alter form almost entirely just to make sure that that, that pocket of pink is not lost. Because if you're familiar at all with spalted wood, you'll know that um, you can get veins, um, like sort of like marble. You can get an area that's green or an area that's yellow or an area of zone lines, and you might not have that anywhere else in the piece. And so you can go into turning with the best of intentions and thinking, all right, I've, you know, it's a, it looks like it's all zone lined. I'm gonna make a pot out of it. And then you get in and you realize, you know, you start seeing those zone lines go away and you're thinking, oh, okay, um, change, change of idea. I am going to not do that anymore. And then you start, you start having to look at the piece more in terms of where the spalting is and following the spalting instead of following what you wanted to do. And that can lead to some very interesting shapes and just because of the way fungi tend to grow in wood, it often leads to uh, pieces that have wider bottoms. It often, at least in my work, um, it, it can lead to pieces that need to have uh, thicker bottoms or that may not have a continuous wall thickness because again, the so zone lines um, will often run up and down a piece, but then pool, it seems like a lot of the times on the end grain and I like the the circular zone lines and you can get them to do that on the end. Um, um, but the pigments, they tend to preferentially run radially and so you'll see them streaking around the sides and you may just have one. So if you have nice zone lines and nice pigment, you may have a, a bowl that you want it to be, you know, a bowl shape and that ends up having a much wider base so that you can see the pooling zone lines and then we'll go something like that because there was that pink and you were not going to lose it. Right. Right. So really, you're, you're engaged in a dialogue with the wood, and you're really taking your cues from the color and from the zone lines. Yep. And if, if you know that your next cut is going to just remove what you have just uncovered, then you'll stop. That's yeah, right. and, and oftentimes I'll just have a piece that will be like, okay, and, and it's done. It, I hadn't intended upon it being done, mm -hmm. but I know enough about how fungi grow and, and how they, you know, what they look like that I can tell when it's gonna be, all right, this is, this is the edge and I can't do anymore. And there are even some times where I know that I can't even sand it at that point because 
there's sometimes there's some pigments that are very very light and if you get them in a high enough concentration to see like the yellows um, even a bit of sanding can take away the saturation that you need and so sometimes you have a piece and, and you're just done that's it you sound like a painter <laughs> you know it's that how do you know when it's done well you when it's done and um, that's kind of a bold move in, in the face of um, wood turners that um, have a right way attitude about about turning isn't it I well I mean to be really honest I've had I've had sometimes a difficult time with the wood turning community not as a whole I have great I have had great mentors through the whole thing but you know every so often um, especially with with people when I'm when I'm doing demonstrations at symposiums and things there's you know there's a, there's very much ideas about what is proper turning and people are very nice about it but you know there are always the comments of that's that's different you know have you tried this technique well this technique would work better for you from people who don't turn spalted wood yeah well you know there there's a difference between an actual beginner who is learning the the rudimentary the basic techniques of turning and uh, uh, an intermediate or advanced turner who is keeping an open mind about how they're working or, or pursuing a different um, uh, vision. I, I'll tell you a quick little story about my uh, dear friend, Dale Nish. When I first began doing, yes, that, you know, Dale gave me that jacket there. And um, when I first began doing uh, the textured pieces, uh, which was a, about uh, 1979, 1980, uh, where I was turning the wrong way on purpose, uh, where I essentially uh, went back to when I first began turning and used to catch the, the tool in the wood, and it would make just horrendous gouges. Well, then I started catching the, uh, the tool in the wood on purpose and trying to control those catches and uh, creating very interesting uh, textures that revealed the grain of the, of the wood. Um, and, and it was different than being subservient to the material polishing and sanding forever. Um, and, it, and it was a direction that I was pursuing. And when Dale saw that work, he said, this looks like something a beginner would do. And I said, really? Thanks, Dale. I appreciate that. And, you know, it was, um, uh, it was an eye-opening thing for him because after a while the pieces began to grow on him. And it was a different approach and a different way of working. And I remember when I was first doing that kind of work that um, I, I had woodworkers and wood turners come up to me in all sincerity and say, you know, I just have to ask you a question. Why would you do that to the wood? I mean, I just don't understand. Why on earth would you, would you ruin the wood that way? And I said, well, you mean something that costs $5,000? Is ruining the wood. I mean, you, you don't have a possibility that that it's something different that you haven't thought about before. And they walked away, scratching their heads, and and eventually, you know, went their own way and either accepted it or or didn't accept it. And that's the whole point when you're doing something differently than what everyone seems to be doing. What everyone seems to expect as the norm, you're swimming against the tide, you're going against the, the current. And it, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And, um, you know, you have to be able to withstand the criticism. Wait, do you get, I get this, I'm wondering if you get this, do you get the, um, how long have you been, well, maybe not now, because like you're a smart linguist, but at some point, um, did you get the, how long have you been turning when someone looks at your piece? As that sort of, you must be, and then when you say, well, I've been turning for, you know, 20 years or something, and they go, oh. When they, when they do ask, I say, it's been a long time, and, uh, you know, I refer them to um, 
magazine articles that, have, that were published in the 70s. That's the, that's the whole point. When you look in a book and you see a piece of work, you don't see how it was done. You don't know how it was made. You just see the final end result. You see what, what you know, is the product of someone's uh, work process and workflow. And that's the point of it. it. It's not how you get there, it's that you get where you are aiming to go. And, uh, you know, of course, how you get there is important because it's a personal thing, but that's the whole point. It's a personal thing. Uh, I think that there is an interesting thing that occurs, and it has been uh, uh, right from the very beginning, and that is the commodification of skill uh, levels and perceptions of skills and tools and things like that, which you have to remember, these things are all sold as well. You know, tools are sold, and a certain kind of gouge is sold, and, and it's, someone said, told me that it was the, the new golf. You know, there's always a new putter. There's always a new... That's clever. Yeah. It is, because there's yeah. always a new tool or a new grinder or a new yeah something. Well, you know, my father used carbide tip tools at General Electric. He was a master machinist. And, you know, we used uh, carbide tip tools to, uh, to, to make uh, uh, very special turning tools that, that would allow us to make bowls in spalted wood very quickly. And I used body grinders, you know, auto body sander on the outside of the bowl. And it was, it was a fast way to get to the, you know, a, a, a uniform shape with no a pecking or chipping. And um, people were just shocked at that. And I'm, I don't care, you know, be shocked. It's all the better. Controversy is a wonderful thing, you know. It doesn't matter how you how you make it. It's that you make it, you know. And and uh, I, I think it's you know I'm I'm I haven't been outspoken about this kind of thing for a very long time, and I am now because you know you've asked a couple of questions and and. Uh, I, I think it's a, a very dangerous thing for, for people to be, um, you know, creating standards that, that they expect everyone to adhere to. And that there are many ways to arrive at the, at the end result, um, many ways to get there, and many ways to do things. Peter.
scared turning and doing this without the mask for the video. Always wear a mask. Look at that you can see the the brown of the original sycamore haloing through here this is really interesting because here's your here's your fungus this is your rot and um, and then here's the zone line and it looks like the fungus was so hesitant to even go up to the zone line that this area around it isn't even decayed which gives the zone line a like a halo
that's what that um, that's what that hook does for you. See that hook right there? You can come in right like this. to 600 grit but a lot of the white rot areas have not been repaired we're kind of trying to go for a blend of styles here i tend to sand a moderate amount since this is a collaborative spalting piece we really want to see some of what the spalting has done to the wood and you'll see that so this is um, sycamore and it has large rays you can see the ray flecking and here you see that white ray so a fungus was in there took out the lignin there's a lot of white rot through here. And again, up through here, you can see those bleached rays. Look at something like this. You can see there's sound areas and rotted areas all within this zone line. The sound areas probably won't uptake the dye quite as nicely as the rotted areas. I don't know if it will uptake it at all because this is sycamore. So we have a lot of experimentation to do. We also have a lot of pigments to use right now, today. We're only going to be using our base three. So we have our red, which depending upon how concentrated you make it, is a red, a pink, an orange, or a purple. We have our yellow, which again, depending upon concentration, is a yellow, a brown, or a light green, or sometimes a purple. And then we have the blue-green of Chlorosaboria, which can be blue or green, depending upon how concentrated you make it. I'm going to be using pipettes to put it on. I prefer to use pipettes. Other people use brushes. These.
actually came up and over. So if we move around over here, you can see it's come over onto the inside. I still have to move all the colors onto the inside. The bowl is rather thick, so they're not coming through like they normally would. So the next step is going to be the yellow.
Hi, I'm Dr. Sari Robinson from Oregon State University. My lab is the Applied Mycology Lab, um, and it's in the Department of Wood Science at Oregon State University. And it is hard to not let the spalting consume your identity. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. So, <laughs> so your book, Spalted Wood, which, you know, uh, I have to admit, it's like a New York City telephone book. It's, it's, it's like... Big. You could kill no, a burglar with it. Yeah, you could. Uh, and... You know, the amazing thing is, when I first looked at it, I opened it up and was thumbing through it, and there were all these pictures of really ancient woodwork with all this stuff, and it was like immediately eye-opening, uh, just amazingly, uh, you know, educational. It wasn't until, you know, two-thirds or more into the book possibly even three quarters, that it came to this section on spalted wood in the 20th century. And then this story about uh, Mel and, and my involvement. You were at a time and a place where people were moving back into handicrafts and were interested in bucking the trends of what was normally done. And it was just like this perfect time and you had the perfect material in it. Industry shifted down to, you know, sort of, uh, this experimental level and so did uh, wood turning for, for that matter because Mel was a master machinist you know with General Electric and a, and a, um, uh, a manager of quality control so he you know and yet he had this hobby of, of wood turning you know which he couldn't have done without all of the knowledge that he had from working as a machinist mm -hmm. at General Electric, you know, and, and playing with uh, the lathe and all that kind of stuff. A lot of things happened that way uh, with, with all of the craft media. There was a time that uh, it was really being back to the earth for a lot of people. They decided that they wanted mm -hmm. to get close to the earth again and get away from corporations and things like that. And then began making things with their hands, and yet they had uh, access to technology, which was an interesting thing. So the technology, uh, or science as you would call it, um, you know, gave entree into various aspects of working with materials that then became languages uh, for these um, craftspeople to speak through. Things happened in the way they happened. They, they, they happened organically. They didn't happen scientifically. They just, they just happened. Later on, um, you know, certain people, yourself being among many, uh, have uh, gotten into serious uh, university research and developed uh, what no one would ever even have thought possible. Spalted wood uh, and the pigments and the science of it could be in solar panels. To think that it could be, you know, a UV protectant for uh, paint, you know, for surfaces, decks, houses, house siding. I, I would still really like to see if there's something that could be done in the realm of uh, camera sensors. No one have even imagined that you would write a book entirely on spalted wood that included the depth of information that it does. I think it's great that the book is as big as it is. It's a coffee table mm -hmm. sized book and um, you know, it, it's it's a it's really something to try to wade through. You're not going to sit down and. It's not know, a one sitting kind no, of book. No, it's not. It isn't. Uh, you can you can pick it up and go over it uh, again and again, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's it's really quite extraordinary. It's helping to change the dialogue too. I mean, that's that's amazing that that level of just like just because of the book, it's it's gone from the sort of base collective consciousness of spalting exists to, oh, there's these things. I think perhaps one of the most significant things that has happened with the book is that whereas 
since the 60s, spalted wood has been about black zone lines, calligraphic lines. You literally redefined it to include and encompass color in wood and uh, show throughout history that it has been there from the beginning, equally as much, if not more. So, uh, you know, people think of spalted wood as being all about black zone lines, um, which is, that's great, that's what it is, but it's also now about wonderful pigments and wonderful colors, and, and not only that, you are beginning to make those available to to people, and anyone can, uh, I mean, I, I just can't believe that you've been able to duplicate, uh, you know, zone lines in an hour in, in the lab. In the uh, late 70s, when I was teaching at the Worcester Craft Center, teaching wood and design, uh, a couple that took an uh, evening adult education uh, chorus who were biologists and uh, chemists and had a lab uh, asked to have some spalted wood and see if they could if they could duplicate it in the lab and they were not able to and you know you did it and and developed it and now you're making it available to people that's the amazing thing so people can actually come to your website and find out answers to their questions and then actually buy the starter kit to make their own spalting. There was an article published in one of the trade magazines that, uh, you know, said that spalted wood was dangerous to your health. When I read your article that about the health aspects of working with spalted oh, wood. Oh, an American wood turner. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, you you have proved that working with spalted wood is not inherently dangerous to to one's health, and not only that, you are doing testing through the university. Yeah, so we finally, um, you know, we could we could talk about this for hours, but right now we're actually we've we've set up our second round of zebrafish testing. We work with zebrafish embryos um, and exposing them to the pigments because there's there's no reason to test zone lines. They are, they are inert. We know they're inert. Melanin as well. Yeah, melanin. We are a science affiliation now, so we have the capacity to test them. So we are growing zebrafish in pools of spalted pigment. Um, and we've done one round already, but it's science, so we have to be sure. So in our first round, it was, and the results were very clear that the pigment is bound to the glass because these pigments are not water soluble. And so nothing, nothing happens. The pigment may very well be toxic to zebrafish, but we will never know because it doesn't come off the glass in order for them to actually affect anything. And it's the same if you put it in textiles, um, it, it doesn't move with your sweat. We've done tests on this with sweating and crocking and rubbing and bleaching and it doesn't come off. So it doesn't matter. Pigment is irrelevant. And the long and short of it is, I mean, for, for woodworkers is that uh, dust, sawdust mm -hmm. is the culprit really. You know, exposure to dust to your lungs without, you know, being properly protected, it can cause It can cause problems. cancer. Yeah. There's tons of studies on that. The EPA has a big old sheet on it, too. Well, there are all yeah. kinds of woods. Walnut is toxic, can mm -hmm. be toxic. Cedars. Redwood. Redwood, cedar. Those things will just take you out. There's a lot of, like, and, and the exotic woods, Coca-Bolo, you can have, you know, allergic reactions mm -hmm. to. The advice that you give and that I also give is to uh, use adequate ventilation, and that means like a blower system, you know, vacuum system, where, you know, good dust uh, protection, either uh, a, a double uh, canister cartridge type system uh, or a powered air uh, respirator kind of system, which is what I use and I'm very careful about. If you're a serious woodworker right. and you're in there every day, six, eight hours, and you're not wearing a mask. Right. Every, every time that you don't put the mask on is a time that you're building more exposure mm -hmm. to uh, toxicity uh, in your system.
you know, and this goes uh, also for finishes as well. Just don't use finishes without adequate ventilation and masks. It's uh, this stuff is really important. I think that Zary would say uh, uh, above all, uh, spalted wood is not dangerous. Just use the precautions that you should be using mm -hmm. with all wood, and that's the, that's the main thing. It's a wonderful material, and and you know I I would say now because of what Sari has done, and it's Dr. Sarah Robinson who uh, is referred to by her friends as Sari. Um, look for color. Look for those colors. Those blues. Those reds. Those greens all of that color that's possible. I'm, I'm just really thrilled that you came to visit Sarah. I am so happy that you invited me, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and I, I wish you all the luck with your program at the university and uh, all great success. I hope that you, know, you crack the code of spalted wood down to its core and we will benefit from, from your research and your your school's uh, department's research and everything that you've been doing. It's, it's an amazing thing that you've opened up so many new doors with just, you know, spalted wood. We are currently in the process of doing whole genome sequencing on the fungi. So not just part, we're going to get their whole genome. And that will allow us to target the area of the genome responsible for pigment production, which will allow for industrialization of the pigment, which means that you might actually be able to purchase your solar cells at a reasonable price instead of it being, you know, just for the elite. Wow. Amazing developments. And to think that it's just spalted wood, mm -hmm. not just, just spalted wood anymore. Congratulations. Yeah, to you too for a wonderful lifetime of accomplishments that made all this possible. Because without you and your dad, there'd be no first rung of the stool to stand on. Oh, thank you. I... This has been amazing. <laughs> I am so glad. I hope you're as excited as I am. <laughs> Ciao.
beginner mind. Uh, beginner mind.